Okay, let's check out uh, number one here. Gives us a, uh, we have a graph here. This is a baker's creating a birthday cake. The base of the cake is the region in the first quadrant, bounded by the graph of y equals f of x. And uh, the x interval here is 0 to 30. The uh, function itself is 20 sine pi x over 30. x and y are measured in centimeters. And the region r is shown in the figure. And we know the derivative of f is uh, given also, so we don't have to figure that out, although that wouldn't be terribly tricky to figure out, but we gave it to us anyway. All right, so for uh, part A, we were asked to uh, find the area, or so the region R uh, is cut out of a 30 by 20 uh, centimeter rectangular sheet of cardboard, and the remaining cardboard is discarded, and we want to find the area of the discarded cardboard. <coughs> so bottom line here is if we can figure out the area uh, from 0 to 30 of our f of x dx function that ultimately would give us the area under the curve and if we were to cut that piece of cardboard out that was 20 by 30 <coughs> we could subtract that area from 600 20 by 30 piece of cardboard so <coughs> calculate a problem so if we uh, punch that in let's see what we should have gotten so we got uh, <coughs> our function is 20 sine I x over 30 and from 0 to 30. Everything typed in right? That's good. Nope, forgot my x. There you go. There we go. All right, so we get that 381, 971, etc. And ultimately, again, that's the answer to that. And then we're going to go with 600 minus that. The 600 is the area of the cardboard rectangle. So final answer then be 600 minus that. So that should have been 218.028. And it would be centimeters squared. The area here is in centimeters. Or the length there in centimeters. So the area is in centimeters squared. All right, uh, if you had the integral correct, two points, answer, one point. Three points total. Generous. All right, <coughs> then the uh, next part here says the cake is a solid with a base in R. Uh, cross sections of the cake perpendicular to the x axis are semicircles. Okay. And so, <coughs> just before we, uh, before we answer the actual question here, just keep in mind that uh, in our picture, the cross sections that are perpendicular to the x-axis are semicircles. Remember, this is a situation where <coughs> the uh, cake, if you will, is coming out of the board at us with the base. It's on the paper. Um, it's coming out at us as a semicircle. All right. <coughs> and so, if we need to find the uh, the volume of the cake, we can uh, certainly set up a, a sentence to do that. But let's see what, uh, what we're asked here. It says, uh, if the baker uses 0 0.05 grams of unsweetened chocolate for each cubic centimeter of cake, how many grams will they need to be in the cake? So ultimately, we need to know, this is for each cubic centimeter, if we knew the volume of this cake, that's going to be the key to getting this right here. So remember the, when we have this situation where we have a solid whose base is in the xy plane, that we start out by first writing a sentence that gives us the area of one slice. And since it's a half circle, we'll use half pi r squared as our original equation. And then from there, we want to see if we can write a sentence in x here. Well, we know that, uh, that the distance from here to here, the diameter of that circle, would be the function, f of x, if you will. Okay, so the radius then is going to be half of that. So ultimately, we'd have 10 sine of pi x over 30 squared. <coughs> and again, why 10? Because we want the radius of this and not the diameter. And the radius is going to be half of the diameter, the diameter being 20 sine pi x over 30. So in this case, we will have uh, 10 instead of 20 there. All right, and ultimately that's our integrand. Remember, that's the area of the one slice. So if we're going to write an integral here on 0 to 30 of all the slices, which ultimately give us the volume of the cake, we set our integral up as such. And a half pi can come out front. This would be our integrand. And the thickness of each slice is dx, of course. And we want to find all the slices. So we go 0 to 30. Okay, this is a point in the x direction. 
and we adjust our uh, stuff over here. This is all squared this time. And I think I got it correct. Looks good. Hope so. All right. So ultimately, uh, we get uh, fifteen hundred. And keep in mind, though, that that 1500, that's just the area part here. We still have a half pi out front. So if we multiply that by 0.5 and by pi, look at that. So the volume itself will be 2356.19449 cubic centimeters. And if we can ask, uh, answer the question uh, next, it says that uh, she uses 0 0.05 grams for each cubic centimeter. So that unit that they gave us is 0 0.05, it's grams per cubic centimeter. And ultimately, we want to know how many grams is she going to need. So just, again, trying to decide what to do with these two numbers, let's look at the units. Okay. If I multiplied centimeters cubed times grams per centimeter cubed, what's going to happen? We get grams. Centimeters cubes will cancel out. So that tells us what to do with these two numbers. We're just going to go ahead and multiply them. So if we go times 0 0.05, we get 117.809, or actually 810 then, to round it. All right, two points for the integral part. We wrote the correct integral two points, one point for the right answer 117.810 grams. on that one. All right. <clears throat> and uh, the last problem here is what makes this a BC problem. This is actually not on the AB part because uh, the last part's a BC problem. It's curve length. So uh, what is the perimeter of the base of the cake? Ultimately, we know the bottom of the base is 30. That part's uh, pretty easy to come up with, right? So the 30 part here, when we look at our picture. And then ultimately, we just know, need to know that curve length. Okay? So we know that the curve length, our perimeter sentence, if we write 30 plus, and we write the uh, integral from 0 to 30 of our square root of 1 plus the derivative squared dx, that that right there is going to give us the result. Uh, remember, this is no different than curve length for our parametric equations. The only difference is that. Uh, you know, this thing is written in terms of just y in terms of x. When it's y in terms of x, this one is always 1, okay, and this one is always dy dx. Okay. All right. And ultimately, thinking of uh, writing from, if I knew that, uh, just say it for argument's sake, that y equals sine x was my equation here. Remember, to write that in parametric form, we'd go x equals t and y equals sine t. Okay. So in parametric form with the same curve, what would what would be in the first parentheses? What's the derivative of t? 1. There's your 1. What's the derivative of sine t? Whatever the derivative is, it goes here. That's your dy dt, if you will. Okay. So remember that <coughs> if you know the curve length formula for parametric equations, it's no different for y equals x equations. Okay. If you want to, if you need to, write it in parametric form. x is always going to be t, and y is always going to be whatever the function is in t. So you're always going to get 1 there if you do that always going to get the derivative here. Okay. And we know that in general it's the integral on whatever interval we're on, 0 to 30 in this case. <coughs> and if we punch that into the calculator, we get it uh, should be 81.804 centimeters. Two points for the integral, one point for the answer. So these are things that, uh, you know, from the BC stuff, you know, if you don't have that memorized yet, this curve length formula, I mean, that's three points that you don't want to blow. A pretty easy question if you know the formula. So these are some things you might want to jot yourself some notes down about things that you want to study and make sure you start memorizing if you don't have them memorized already. Like I said, that's you know, too easy of three points to not get. <coughs> okay. Let's carry on then to uh, number two. Right. 
uh, number two, you might remember because it was an AV problem also. So in, uh, number two, we got uh, storm is washing sand away from the beach, causing the edge of the water to control over the nearby road. The rate at which the distance between the road and the edge of the water is changing in the storm is modeled by T cubed plus cosine T minus three meters per hour, T hours after the storm began. And it says the edge of the water was 35 meters from the road when the storm began, and the storm lasted five hours. So with all that said, we know that the derivative of f, they gave us the derivative again conveniently, even though, again, that was probably an easy derivative to find, but <coughs> feeling uh, generous giving us the derivative time saver, I guess. But. All right, <coughs> so in part A here, it says, uh, what was the distance between the road and the edge of the water at the end of the storm? So remember, keep in mind that, uh, that this f function that they gave us is giving us the, essentially the change, the rate at which the distance is changing. Okay? And so, and keep in mind that it's in meters per hour. So in the context here, it's not really a velocity, but it's kind of like a velocity, isn't it? Okay? And if we integrate it, it's going to give us the displacement or the change. Okay? So therefore, if we do from 0 to 5 of our f of t dt, and that's going to give us the change in position of this uh, water line, if you will. And keep in mind, though, that it was 35 from the road, so we need to take that into account at the beginning. And then when we do the math on that, it turns out to be 26.495 meters. So at the end of the storm, that water has gotten closer to the road by that much. By nine and some change. Eight and some change, I should say. One for the integral, one for the answer. Point break down there. Questions on part A. Okay. <coughs> part B says uh, using correct units, interpret the value of f prime of four equaling 1.007 in terms of the distance between the road and the edge of the water. So they've given us uh, f prime at 4 equals 1.007, and we want to uh, interpret what is that What is that telling us? Well, we know that the 4 is representing a what? It's time. So we could say, start out with say, at time equals 4, 4 hours in fact, so at time equals 4 hours. And what is this uh, derivative telling us here? Remember that, that the function itself is measured in meters per hour, isn't it? And so therefore, its derivative would be meters per hour per hour. Be meters per hour squared, it would be essentially like an acceleration, wouldn't it? Okay. All right. And so <coughs> stated uh, as we should state it, you know, it's, again, it's not, it's not really velocity, so we don't really want to say it's acceleration. It's kind of like acceleration because we've got similar units. Okay. All right. So bottom line, though, is this is a... <coughs> that the, this is the, essentially how the rate of change is increasing. It's how the rate is changing. Okay. And so since it's positive, it's increasing at a rate of, okay. we could say that the f function or rate of change is increasing at a rate of 1.007 meters per hour squared. Now, uh, two points, one for having, actually just one for having the units only, so even if you blew the explanation, you get a point for having the units right, which is, again, fairly easy points if you're car careful. Interpretation part was worth one also. All right, let's take a look at uh, part C here. It says, at what time during the, during the five hours of the storm was the distance between the road and the edge of the water decreasing most rapidly? decreasing most rapidly. And I think uh, you know, I've mentioned this hit a few times, but bottom line is if we have an increasing or a decreasing situation like this, say for argument's sake, okay, we're increasing most rapidly when we're right in the middle, if you will, of the maximum minimum. Okay? And ultimately, what are those points for us? Uh, they're inflection points. So we're going to want to find the inflection point or points here. And so again, we're dealing with the first uh, uh, four hours only, it says, right? Or five hours, all five hours, I guess. So let's look at the uh, 
if we look at the derivative here, because again, we want to know when the, uh, when the rate of change, which is our f function, we want to know when it's decreasing most rapidly. So let's first of all find out when is, when is it decreasing. So if we look at our rate of change function here, which is square root of x. plus cosine x minus 3. All right. So. So bottom line is it looks like it's uh, this function is decreasing from here to here. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so that means that uh, ultimately we want to know in the uh, the derivative of course of this function would be zero at these two points. True. All right. And so <clears throat> the. Uh, Find those points. Find the maximum first. Should have found the minimum. So it's closer to it. So that uh, first point. And you gotta keep in mind that this was my uh, this is my f function. And that point is uh, x equals. 0.66187 and the other one So these are the uh, these are the two values in question where the derivative equals zero here. All right. Now, what I want you to uh, <coughs> if we read the question again, though, I'll read it carefully. It says that uh, during the storm, okay, <coughs> uh, at what time was the distance between the road and the edge uh, decreasing most rapidly? Now, remember here that our f function is not the distance, right? Okay, our f function is actually the the derivative of the distance, if you will, wouldn't it? Okay. And so keep in mind that uh, I guess the question that what we need to make sure we're careful about here is that we don't want to find this point, the inflection point, if you will. Okay. These two points are a few candidates right here. Okay. The two where the derivative equals zero, because the derivative we are given is really the second derivative of the position. Because okay. think about, uh, <coughs> again, there, the function they gave us, the f function, okay, is the is not the distance between the water and the road. It's the rate of change of the distance of the water and the road. Okay, and remember when they asked the question, they said, okay, when, is, when is the distance between the water and the road decreasing most rapidly? Okay. So ultimately, the f function they gave us was already the derivative. Okay. The derivative of that f prime is the second derivative that we're after here. So we ultimately want to know okay, where does the um, second derivative equal 0? And that's going to be at these two points that I have marked. Okay. Now remember, though, that uh, <coughs> we're dealing here with a closed interval, so we could use the candidate test also. We could just test these and see which one gives us the appropriate number. Okay. Um, keep in mind that if we did that, we need to use our uh, f of 0. We know f of 0 is uh, uh, negative 3. One minus three, so negative two. So it's cosine. Cosine of zero is one. All right. So that uh, rate of change right there would be negative two. 
And if we do the 5, if we put a 5 in there, we're going to get radical 5 plus cosine 5 minus 3. And that one's going to give us negative 0.48. Zero. Okay. Now, keep in mind, again, we're, we're talking about decreasing most rapidly. And remember that f here is a derivative. And this is where, the, I, guess the, I guess, the tricky part is making sure that you keep track of the fact that f is actually uh, the derivative of our distance function that we're dealing with here. So, <coughs> so far, that one is most rapidly, if you will. It's negative 2. Yeah, this one, negative 0.48, not as much. And then if we do our uh, other two candidates, we do 0.66187. And 2.8403829. Turns out if we put that into the f function, we get uh, negative 1.39760. So still not more than negative 2, like the left end point. And this one, negative 2.26963. So as it turns out, it would be this one. That one is the largest value, if you will. All right, and then interpreting answer-wise, it says uh, at what time? So the time in question would be the time 2.84 seconds, or not seconds, but hours. And again, this is your justification. This is your uh, candidate test. So finding the candidates, finding the second derivative equal to zero. And remember again, the key point here is that this f prime of t is our second derivative in our case. So if we set that equal to zero, found these two points, that was worth one. Uh, the answer here is worth one if you got 2.84 hours. And the justification part was worth one. Um, <coughs> they, uh, they don't talk about having to use the candidate test here. And they, they just said during the first five hours of the storm, which uh, normally in a problem like this, they're going to give us the actual interval with uh, 0 and 5 marked with brackets, indicating that it's a candidate test problem. Okay, so if you, just did, if you just got the two candidates here and did your first derivative test, that would be another justification that would be acceptable here. Okay, they, don't, they don't say you have to have all the candidates at the endpoints because they really didn't explicitly say the endpoints were part of it, even though they, they didn't really say that they're not, I guess, either. So... But ultimately, they would have, I think, accepted either either justification if you used your first derivative test to show that this is a the biggest one. All right. And let's see, in uh, part D, Okay, in uh, part D, we have, uh, it says after the storm, machine pumps sand back onto the beach, so the distance between the road and the edge of the water was growing at a rate of G of P meters per day. And it says here that uh, P is the number of days since the pumping began. And we want to write an equation involving an inter integral expression whose solution would give the number of days the sand must be pumped to restore the original distance between the road and the edge of the water. So ultimately, we know that uh, if we went from, let's say, 0 to x of our g of p function, okay, keeping in mind that this g of p is in meters per day, so if we find the area um, under that curve, we'd get meters. Okay. So ultimately, this function is putting sand back on the beach, if you will. Okay. And so if we wanted to figure out a function here that would give us the number of days it would take, Okay, we need to we need to really figure out what x is here. True. Okay, how many days would we need in order to, for this to put all the sand back on the beach that was taken off? So ultimately, we'd want that to be equal to how much sand was taken off the beach, okay, and how much sand was taken off the beach. In terms of the distance, maybe that 35 minus what we found in part A. Or, <coughs> excuse me, it wouldn't be 35 minus. It would just be the integral part of what we found in part A. 
because that would be the change in distance that we found. So if we did that change in distance from 0 to 5 of our uh, f of t function. Okay. Now the question is, would we want those two to be equal to each other? Because ultimately, what is this going to be? This is going to be... This is going to be negative, isn't it? We know sand was taken away from the beach here. So in order for these two sentences to be equal, this is going to be a positive. This is going to be a negative. So we'd want the opposite of this then, wouldn't we? Then those two would be equal to each other. Um, could, we, uh, could we have set up something like, say, this? Sand on plus sand off equals zero. Wouldn't that have worked also? That sentence is fine, too, if you just said those two added together equaling zero. Okay, that would work as well. Uh, two points. One, if you had the integral g part. And then uh, another point, if you had the whole thing. Some expression that made sense. Questions on any part of number two? Okay, let's take a look at number three then. Uh, do number three to the picture turn out crappy or is you got a picture? Your picture's good? Oh, mine didn't turn out good. So I need to look at the picture here for a second. So we ultimately have, uh, looks like we have a curve here that uh, is a line segment and a uh, <coughs> just some curve. They don't give an equation for it. It says it's tangent to the x-axis at 3 and it's uh, twice differentiable. The derivative, second derivative, uh, is greater than 0. So in other words, it's uh, concave up for that curve part. Okay. so. See what we got here in part A. <coughs> the question in uh, part A is, is f differentiable at 0? And it says use the definition of a derivative and one side of the limits to justify your answer. Okay. So ultimately, the answer here would be what? No. Okay. Right. So the answer is no. Okay. And ultimately, that uh, <coughs> in order for there to be a limit at 0, or in order to be differentiable at 0, the, the derivative on the left coming from the left and the derivative coming from the right need to be equal to each other. Okay, so what do we know about the derivative from the right? Or from the left, let's say. Start with the left. So from the left, it's just going to be that, uh, that line segment, isn't it? And it looks like it goes from, uh, goes up 2 and over 3 to get from one to the other, and that 0 point, the 2 intercepts. So wouldn't that be uh, 2 thirds? And what do we notice about the derivative from the right? We don't know that curve, but bottom line is it's what? Negative. Negative something. So therefore, <coughs> not differentiable. Right? <coughs> uh, one thing that you need to do here, though, is that uh, they specifically said use the definition of the derivative here. So you need to show that difference quotient. So remember, limit as h approaches 0 from the left, we'll say, of our f of h minus f of 0 over h is 2 thirds. Since they said use the definition of a derivative, you need to have that in there somewhere to get the points. Okay. So one point for that, one point for the justification, which is this, essentially. And your limit as h approaches 0 from the right. Is negative. Okay. Right, you're right. Less than zero, I guess. So two points. One for 
again, key, key piece of uh, information though, that they said specifically use the definition of a derivative, so you need to have that difference quotient in there, that limit of difference quotient. All right, let's take a look at uh, the next part. Part B says, uh, for how many values of A between negative four and six is the average rate of change of F on the interval A to six equal to zero? So, <coughs> so how many values of A between negative four and six is the average rate of change of the function on the interval um, A to six equal to zero? So bottom line here is if we go uh, uh, <coughs> the average rate of change on A to 6, remember that average rate of change is just the slope between those two points. So ultimately our A here is the point A F of A, we don't know what A is, 6, F of 6. So those are the two points, because ultimately if we're going to do something with the average rate of change, we need to find the average rate of change first. Okay. So if we do the slope between those two, f of 6 minus f of a, all over 6 minus a. Uh, where am I looking? Right, that's what I'm going to do. It's going to be 1 minus f of a, or 6 minus a. All right. And again, we want to know for how many times, when is this equal to zero is essentially the question. So if we set that equal to zero, and we do our, uh, uh, you know, the only, the only way that this fraction can equal zero is if the top equals zero, we know that. So ultimately we know that uh, the, uh, when one is equal to f of a, would be the only time this sentence would be true. And they want to know when, when is the average rate of change okay, going to be equal to zero. Okay. So we know that that sentence is true. So bottom line is, are there any are there any points here where the a value here is equal to one? <coughs> um, if you look at the uh, the picture, okay, you got the picture in front of you. But bottom line is that it looks like at Somewhere between negative two and negative one, it would be a one. And then again, somewhere, you know, right around one, one ish, somewhere in there. How come six, one doesn't count to give us three? We can see that the answer is, is going to be two values. <coughs> uh, there would be a zero on the bottom for that, but there is another reason too. What they tell us in their question. Six part of the six not in the interval, is it? Okay. So six is out. Okay. So there'd be two values because there's two spots where the function equals one. Okay. Uh, if we found the average rate of change, that's one point, and the answer with the reason is here. All right. Take off the next part. Okay, uh, on uh, part C, it <coughs> says, is there a value between, uh, is there a value A between negative 4 and 6, not including 6, where which the, for which the mean value theorem applied on the interval A to 6 guarantees that uh, there's a value C such that between A and C, the derivative is equal to 1 third. Okay. All right, so it seems <coughs> sounded kind of complicated sounding. Okay. But bottom line here is that uh, if we look at the, the function that we were given, keeping in mind that we're going to 6, 1 here, and knowing that we have 0, 2 here as our y-intercept, okay. keep in mind that if we're dealing with the mean value theorem here, and we want to know does the derivative anywhere equal negative 1 third. Okay. If, we found the, uh, if we found a point where the slope between the endpoints was negative 1 third, then the mean value theorem would guarantee just that, wouldn't it? So let's try these two. If this, if this is 0, 2, and this is uh, 6, 1, if I do uh, 1 minus 2, 
and I do 6 minus 0, I get negative 1 on top, I get 6 on the bottom. That would be negative 1, 6 between the endpoints, right? Okay. <coughs> All right. However, uh, what we want to know, though, <coughs> is when is the, is there a spot where the slope would be equal to 1 third? Well, we were, you know, just looking at the picture, we knew that one, this wasn't going to work because it's going down. We need it to equal 1 third, ultimately. So let's try another point. What about this 3, 0 point? If we did uh, the 3, 0 point, we'd have 0 minus 1, and then we'd have 3 minus 6, which would be negative 1 over 0 minus 1, and that would be negative 1 over negative 3. That would be your 1 third right there. Wouldn't it? And picture-wise, remember what we're getting at here is that if we were to pick this value here of 3, 0, okay, and we find the slope between the endpoints to be 1 third, what is the mean value theorem guarantee? that somewhere between those two points we're going to have a slope of one-third also on our tangent line. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> based on that, let's see if we can answer the question now. The question is, is there a value A such that somewhere between A and 6 there's a value C that satisfies the mean value theorem in terms of making the derivative equal to one-third, right? Which is really just a roundabout, roundabout way of saying, is there a point on this curve such that the slope between it and the endpoint will be one third. Okay. And ultimately, we found it, and the, act the actual a value is right here. It's the three, isn't it? Okay. So ultimately, at x equals three, okay. the slope between the endpoints is one third. So therefore, there's somewhere between three and six where the derivative equals one third also. Okay. Um, so bottom line here is that there's a yes or no question. So yes. Uh, and identifying the three, if you get yes, then at x equals three, <coughs> that's a point. And ultimately, your justification here is uh, is your work showing that the slope between those endpoints is a third. Any questions on that one? All right. Then the next part, they give us a g function that's defined as the area of the f function from 0 to x, uh, negative 4 to 6. And it says uh, on what <coughs> intervals, on what intervals contained in negative 4 to 6 is the graph of g concave up? Well, if we want to know about concavity for g, we need to know something about uh, the second derivative. So ultimately, <coughs> the second derivative, the derivative of this is just f, f itself. The second derivative would be f prime. And if it's concave up, what would have to be the case with g double prime? It have to be positive. So we want f prime to be positive. Keep in mind, we're looking at a picture of f. So if we want f prime to be positive, okay, wouldn't that be uh, here and here, those two spots? So it concave up on negative 4 to 0, and also from 3 to 6. So uh, here's the point breakdown for that one. Got one point for recognizing that you need to find derivative first before you can find antiderivative. So if you found the derivative, you got a point for that. If you uh, <coughs> figured out the second derivative and found when it's greater than 0, point for that, and then finally a point for the answer. It's a rare occasion when part D answer is easier than some of the others in front of it. Alright, questions on part D?